first off, hello uh, to everybody at Token 249 Singapore. It's been uh, quite a long time since I've been in Singapore. I, I think maybe 2009. Uh, and I was there uh, working for the CIA, actually, at the embassy. Uh, that's not too far from you, I imagine. The world has changed uh, a lot in 15 years, uh, but what intelligence services do really hasn't. Um, and, and I want to start with that because while their practices haven't changed, the scale of them has. And, and that's what really brought me forward. It's not that, you know, the government was spying on somebody. They, they've always done that. It was the government was spying on everybody. Uh, and it wasn't that they didn't want to do that in the past, but that they didn't have the capability to do it. Uh, we were talking about things that were the Stasi's, you know, wet dream. And now we see that creeping everywhere. Uh, Pavel Durov, uh, the founder of Telegram, was one of the uh, people that I, I tweeted about a few weeks ago. Uh, I had hoped to speak about here because I think this really emblematizes uh, what has changed. Uh, so for those who are unfamiliar, uh, just a few weeks ago, we saw a well-coordinated effort by the old powers to gain control over Telegram by taking its founder, Pavel Durov, uh, as frankly, a hostage uh, in France. Now, they had been complaining publicly that Telegram, uh, which is not a meaningfully secure messenger, by the way, please don't call it a secure messenger when you're describing it to your friends. It's more like a, a standard chat group that has DMs attached. It does have one capability to send end-to-end uh, -end encrypted texts called secret chats, uh, but almost no one uses it, right? Uh, anyway, the, the state apparatus of the U.S. and Europe had been complaining that Telegram had not been providing them enough control over its ecosystem, uh, the ability to shut down channels at will, as they do on Facebook and everybody else, uh, to dox their users, and, and so on. Uh, now, because of some weaknesses in Telegram's design as a service, Telegram did have this ability. Uh, so the governments knew Telegram could be doing if they wanted to, uh, but Telegram apparently did make at least some efforts to resist demands to share this ability for, for what that's worth. So what happens? Uh, Durov is lured to France under whatever pretext, I think it's even public now. Uh, he's immediately tossed in the dungeon and presto changeo a few days later, uh, he's out on bail and Telegram changes its terms of service. That is the unfortunate reality of how the world works uh, when you don't architect your service uh, to resist state interference at the protocol level. And that's what's so special and powerful uh, about crypto broadly, uh, Bitcoin specifically. Uh, but, you know, it, it's that kind of mentality uh, where you design against the worst possible case uh, to avoid the inevitable. Now, uh, in Duro's case, I hope he gets out. Uh, and, and once he's in a free place, he genuinely fixes the design problem that put him in the hot seat in the first place uh, by creating a service uh, that does not put too much power and, and data in vulnerable human hands. Uh, you have to design uh, your app so that there will never be a head that the state can point a gun at or they will do it. But the real lesson here, why it's so important, is not about Durf. It's not about Telegram. It's about us. We are all entering a new phase of history. Uh, where what we consider the more enlightened collection of states globally, ones that had embraced the classically liberal ideal, and I want to clarify here that uh, I'm talking about the supremacy of the individual's right to themselves, the right to decide and direct one's life, rather than you know whatever it is that uh, political parties are brand branding as liberalism today. Uh, the governments of these states that used to champion that idea, are now some of those working hardest to roll it back, to bureaucratize, to influence, to nudge, to shape, to ultimately control each and every individual within their territory and beyond to the extent made newly possible by technology. This is not a different story than 2013. This is the same. Now, in their defense, uh, these states genuinely seem to believe that this is the path to utopia, uh, that they genuinely know what is good for you uh, to a greater extent than you do. 
because they're the expert. <laughs> you know, uh, everyone in this community, you know, knows knows the memes. Uh, whether you're going to eat the bugs or or, or whatever. Um, the thing to remember is that this is a story that we have seen play out in history before. Uh, you have the experts telling you to go out into the field and kill the sparrows. Uh, and now we're in the moment where we're waiting to see what's going to happen next. So it seems to me that the fight over Telegram and even the EU's new chat control proposal, which if you haven't heard of it, uh, you very much need to go and look out uh, for it because the EU is trying to push it again, force it through uh, in the next few weeks. It seems to me that these proposals are less interested in surveillance than they are in control. Uh, they're laying the procedural framework for the global control of the voices of every volume. And that's what it's really about. It's not that they're worried about some secret conversation. It's not that they're trying to shake down Durov for the keys to some conversation. It's that they see people talking in ways that they don't like, ways that they consider to be misinformation, ways that they consider to be disinformation, ways that they consider to be socially harmful, that they consider to be uh, structurally undesirable, and they want to silence it. And that is dangerous. That's the point of no return. We lose that, there's no coming back. Which brings us to modernity and all the ways that it's it's changing around us. Uh, this was not the sort of talk I expected to have when I woke up uh, yesterday, uh, which I spent much of the day reading about Israel's unprecedented campaign of what, by all point, uh, excuse me, <laughs> well, of what, by all reports, appears to be indistinguishable from terrorist bombings, uh, consumer electronics across countries simultaneously exploded in pockets. Hands, faces, cars lost their drivers in mid-motions, the pockets exploding, you know, at uh, checkout lines, at the head height of your children. Now, it's not the first time that we've ever seen a remote bomb, uh, but it is the first time that we've ever seen a broadcast bombing at this scale, a message sent over public communication systems that reaches consumer electronics that are lying in wait, uh, because this is how pagers work, right? It, it's not like one-to-one, uh, -one, these things are chiming back, they're checking in, they're phoning home. They're just listening to the equivalent of radio. Uh, and they hear the signal and they go off. The person who's triggering it doesn't know who you are. They don't know where you're at. They don't know whether you're holding it, your child is holding it, and demonstrably, they do not care. Uh, you don't need to take a position on the legitimacy of whatever the hell it is today, Hamas or Hezbollah or any of Israel's targets, uh, one way or the other, to realize that they have broken a taboo that is very, very dangerous for the comfortable life uh, that we, in sort of the developed part of the world, uh, have cocooned ourselves with. Nearly every single one of you is carrying a remotely controllable device on your person that you have not opened and inspected for explosives. You probably can't even open it. Uh, and even without the explosives, right, you go, oh, I'm not worried about the Mossad, right? Uh, the batteries in your phone, in your laptop, in your electro car, uh, they hold tremendous amounts of embodied energy. And even if it's not going to explode in the same violent way, they can absolutely catch fire. You know, you can go look at a, a line of them on YouTube. Uh, these are things that will not far in the future be able to burn your house down while you sleep as it's on the charger in the other room at the push of the button. And who would we blame, right? It wasn't China that started this. Uh, and this brings me to the, the last thing, which is the rejection of our traditions by some in our, our community. I, I saw this recently, uh, and, and I don't want to be unfair to Sailor, uh, but be contrary to his point here, because uh, I, I haven't followed it closely. Uh, but I, I saw someone digging up old quotes here, and they were saying, I'll read this, uh, that we don't need to uh, talk about like the anarchist angles of Bitcoin. We don't want to talk about privacy. We don't want to talk about the uninterceptable design. We don't want to talk about the fact that no one can silence it. No one uh, can stop it. Because that's going to make billionaires uncomfortable. And they want to be investing in something. They want it to be regulated. They want it to be controlled. They want it uh, to be something that works for them. And I, I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, we need to talk about the rules, values, 
of the system, the crypto part of cryptocurrency. That's what makes it special. Uh, I don't care if it makes billionaires uncomfortable. I don't care if it makes JP Morgan slower to allocate. They don't get a vote because frankly, they're coming along on this ride, whether they like it or not. The dollar is done. Uh, nothing stops this train, as, as Lynn Alden says. It. Debasement is baked into our models. We see what's happening with the uh, percentage of currency issuance, the deficit spending. Uh, it might not happen this year. It might not happen next year. It might not happen in five years. But it's very clear looking at the progress of history where these things end. Uh, we are in the age of paper, uh, but it is on the decline. It is coming to the end. It's not about any flag. Uh, it's about the method. It's what the system is built on. There is no basis, uh, no strong foundation. So we as a community need to focus on keeping alive the thing that made it power currency prosper where all the others have failed. Uh, less comfortably, I think it also means recognizing that a lot of altcoin activity uh, doesn't serve much purpose in the crypto space, uh, frankly, beyond the dilution of the broader crypto monetary base. Uh, not all of it, certainly. There are some good projects out there, but every single one of you in the audience uh, can call to an example to mind where you would agree that even if we dress it up nice, uh, it is just the scammiest form of rug lying in wait uh, that you can imagine. And it's happening again and again and again and again. Um, people are seeing it like gambling, okay. You know, maybe it's like a lottery, okay. Uh, but think about the systemic effect that this is having. If it's not cordoned off, if it's not sort of the toxic waste, everyone recognizes it for what it is. And a lot of people don't, I think. People are wising up as a community more broadly, but there's more participants, right? Uh, there's a new sucker born every day, as they say. Uh, and we shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be exploiting suckers. We should be building a new world uh, because we're already there. And with the old system, right? When the government robs you, at least you can look at the road, oh, maybe I helped build that. Uh, if this community is instead just merely buying some, excuse me, useless jackass and even more useless expensive watch, uh, which system is better? We need to be able to answer that uh, as we occupy a more prominent place in the world. We have to do better if we want to live better. Uh, so uh, with that, I, I just say, look, we need to focus on not being a part of the problem. We have an extraordinary opportunity here. We have changed the world in so many ways, and the world is coming around to listen. Uh, they are beginning to buy in. They are beginning to participate. They see the value, and we don't even have to argue it anymore. Uh, we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the moment in history that has been created by us, for us, and that we will pass to others. And this is to say, when you look at everything happening, when you look at... Uh, the desperation for a new control over speech. Uh, when you look at the rise of these new disruptive technologies uh, of modernity, such as um, AI, the way it's uh, evolving, it can be great for us. It can also be very terrible for us. It depends on who is holding the levers of power and how we decentralize them. Uh, when you look at the new ways consumer electronics are being turned against us, uh, from how they used to be in small individual targeted cases to now mass broadcast level cases. And you see leaders in our space uh, trying to reject our uh, old traditions, the ones that are valuable, the ones that created the space. I think the lessons are clear. And this is to say that we should defy bureaucracy. We should reject modernity, embrace tradition, and you'll save the world. That's all we have to do. Thank you. Let's go to a question or two. All right. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, uh, we do have runners in the audience. Uh, if I've got a hand up, I'll uh, send a microphone over your way. I've got somebody right over there. He's already got a mic, sir. Fire away. All right. Thank you, Mr. Snowden, for all that you do in the world. Um, you mentioned the importance of protocols. Are there any emerging protocols that give you hope? For the new world that we're building? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to endorse anything uh, specifically. I can say, look, I've seen a lot of good protocols. I've seen a lot of calcified protocols. 
Uh, Bitcoin, obviously, I have been a, a huge fan of for a long time. That's something that really feels calcified to me. We know it has a privacy problem. Uh, I've been saying this every year at every one of these conferences for the last 10 years. It still hasn't been fixed. Uh, they're frankly not even trying to fix it. People are like, oh, lightning, lightning, lightning. It doesn't work. It doesn't fix the problem. It's not uh, correct. It's not a solution. Uh, we have seen a lot of application of zero knowledge things that are useful. Uh, we've seen cross-chain bridges that have really uh, become useful and exciting, but they don't uh, answer that privacy aspect. I think the privacy aspect is the most important uh, problem facing crypto today, because again, we're talking about billionaires, we're talking about big money, we're talking about the states. Uh, if you guys don't fix the privacy problem, you are going to be facing the Durov problem. Uh, whether it's your bridge, whether it's tornado cash, whether it's whatever, the gun is going to be facing your head uh, unless you make sure that people can use your systems permissionlessly and privately. All right, thank you very much. I know the runners are, we've got microphone ready right down here, thank you. Hi, Edward, Brendan from Aeroblock. You're a wonderful human being, first and foremost. Um, I worked in national security in Europe in the Middle East 20 years ago. I learned a lot of truths that were unsettling. Quick question, how do we design technology from first principles so we know it's safe? <laughs> Big question. I mean, there's probably, thank you very much. Uh, there's, there's probably people who are in the audience much better qualified to answer that than I do, uh, than I am. Um, I, I mean, when you look back at the, the Bitcoin white paper, I, I think what you see is an adversarial approach to the system. And that's really what you have to be considering. Uh, a lot of people, and you know, I, I don't want to name names, but Solana, uh, are taking good uh, ideas and they're just going, well, what if we just centralized everything? It'll be faster, it'll be more efficient, it'll be cheaper. And yeah, sure, it is, you're right. Uh, but nobody's using it, but for like meme coins and scams. Uh, because if anybody puts anything significant on it, and then all the states begin moving towards it, uh, it's going to be a, a system that has levers that people can simply just take from you. You have to be thinking for the adversarial case, uh, as opposed to the convenient, easy, early case. I mean, that's uncomfortable for like a lot of these founder mode people who are like, oh, no, we need the minimum viable product, this, that, and the other. Sure, um, if you're trying to get rich, that'll work. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of people have demonstrated that. They'll continue to do that. But if you want something that will last, you have to engineer it to last. Uh, and that means thinking about how it's going to be attacked and making sure it can survive that. Uh, because we at Crypto, we're living on the X, on the ground, right? You are at the intersection. Uh, <laughs> you are where the bombs are going to drop. Uh, let's make sure that we have roofs that can survive them. All right, thank you. Uh, where's my microphone? So people have either hands up or if somebody has a microphone in their hand. Can I get a hand? It, with you in the back, yes. yes. Okay, please. Yeah, so you mentioned some issues with uh, current, you know, governments and the past systems not working for the people. But I'm curious to understand, uh, I'm, I'm still skeptical that crypto is a solution to that. And I'm also skeptical of what are certain models or systems that can help move us forward from, you know, state control or being in a fascist state. Uh, so I'm curious about some of your thoughts about moving into mm -hmm. like, you mentioned like a new world or like a new, uh, we're moving into a new paradigm. Um, yeah, I, I'm still skeptical of that. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what are the steps to take in that direction. Sure, Maybe sure, it's sure. not just crypto, yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so look, the uh, bottom line here is crypto is not a solution to all the world's problems. Uh, crypto can be a solution to some private or some, some uh, layers of the problem set. Uh, and that's what's key, right? When we look at what happened in 2013, the revelations of mass surveillance, this had all been done without any public participation, without any debate, even members of Congress in the United States, uh, where these intelligence agencies are saying, you guys passed the laws that made this legal. Uh, Congress was saying, we didn't authorize that. That wasn't our intention. It's not supposed to do this. The courts uh, in the United States said, well, hold up. This program is illegal took them 10 years to get to that point post-revelation, uh, even when they had the evidence, but they eventually say this is illegal, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, the agencies keep doing it the whole time through, right? Through legal changes, through uh, judicial precedents. How? 
Why? How do you control? Well, what we realize is that law doesn't always work as a restraint on the state. Uh, because it doesn't have penalties for the state. When the state breaks the law, right, uh, they don't go to jail. Uh, nobody's going to slap a, a pair of cuffs on the CIA. That's just not how the world works. But what if we could enforce human rights through new means, through math, through technologies, through something that these agencies don't control? That's the power of encryption. That's the power of cryptocurrency. You can create protected spaces that they can't interfere with. Now, again, that's only one part uh, of the problem, but it's a reliable part, and that's what we do. What happens when you talk about the new world? Uh, what happens if the state is no longer in control of money? Uh, you fix the money, you fix the state. And uh, wars have always been financed throughout history on the basis of deficit spending. If government can't just ransack uh, not only their own treasuries, uh, not only their own tax base, but the savings uh, of everyone in their country, and frankly, everybody else in their country, we're talking about things like the U.S., uh, where you've got the world reserve currency, you'll see a much more peaceful world. Uh, <laughs> at least that's the hope. Uh, but we don't know. Uh, what we do know is what we can do. What we do know is that there are places uh, that we can make a difference with, right? We're just technologists. Uh, we're just people who see there are places where the law fails. But maybe we can create a safety net for when that fails. Maybe we can put up more safeguards to encode our values, that liberal ideal, uh, that the individual has some claim over themselves, that society, uh, you know, we do want uh, courts, we do want prisons for bad people, uh, we want to have a safe world, even if we don't want, you know, every other person in jail, uh, we recognize that it is a dangerous world, we need to do some level of policy procedure uh, to take care of that. We need layers of protection, right? Uh, and the way that we intermingle these, the way that we intermarry these, the way that we interlock these things uh, is to make sure that uh, we don't have a single point of failure where you get a bad president, you get a bad legislature, you get a bad court, and it's all over, you're done. Uh, it's supposed to be the people that correct these systems, uh, but the people have been pacified. Uh, we need something that is always working for us, even when we're sleeping, uh, or <laughs> even when we don't get a vote, when it's taken from us, uh, because in a lot of countries, that is the reality. Uh, but if we can encode these values into our protocols, They'll protect people not just in our home, not just in our countries, but around the world. And that is the promise of these new layers, of these new uh, systems for interaction, for association, for speech, for trade. Uh, we can give freedom everyone, everywhere, all the time, and it can't be taken away. Thank you.